Lusitown was a small mountain community far away from almost every problem in the world. The closest big city was either Canterlot or Dusselhoof. All three communities were part of the same royal mountain chain that stretched along a large portion of Equestria. Lusitown had only a few thousand residents scattered along the hills. On one of those hills was a very small family of two, a boy and his mother. The colt, Redrun, was a unicorn like his mother. He was a typical school-age kid who liked roughhousing with his friends and reading comics. In particular, he was a huge fan of the Daring Do comic books. He would get the new ones whenever they came out and would spend weeks poring over every page from the art to the storytelling. The one that currently held his attention was Daring Do and the Violet Star. It was an illustrated thriller detailing Daring Do's quest to recover the Violet Star gem from a temple before the Shadowmancer could get to it. Red Run was most of the way through the thick graphic novel, almost at the end. After a long journey building up to finding the temple, Daring Do found herself facing down the Shadowmancer on the other side of an underground chamber when... Achoo! I heard that, his mother called from the other room. The middle-aged mare walked into the doorway, leaning on the frame and looking at her son. On the floor next to his bed was a big pile of tissues from blowing his nose. Red could barely keep his eyes open from the exhaustion. He had stayed up very late the last several nights reading the Daring Do book. With a sigh, his mother walked off and returned with a thermometer. She was wearing her lab coat as well. Red's mom was a doctor, although he wasn't sure what kind. That didn't matter though, because she was never afraid to wear her lab coat to get results. Mom, he pleaded, to no avail. She took his temperature, shaking her head at the results. Looks like someone needs another dose of medicine, she said. Drooping his head in defeat, Red opened his mouth. Dr. Mom poured the blue medicine into a spoon and fed him a mouthful. He swallowed every bitter drop, just trying to get the flavor away from his tongue. You're going to bed right now, mister she said, taking the book and placing it back on the shelf. Once he was tucked in, she sat down next to the bed. Every night, before bedtime, his mom made sure to pray with him. They said it together. Now I lie myself to sleep, in my dreams that Luna keeps, and that with all the princess might, she will keep away the frights. Going through the little ritual was new for Cornflower. For Red, it was the usual. He had never known anything different, but his mother did. She remembered a time before she felt compelled to pray, a time when the world seemed safer. There used to be no question that they'd wake up the next morning. These days, things seemed to be getting worse with every sunrise. There was one horrible news story after another. The Little Horn Massacre, the Mega Spells, a Ministry Mayor almost being assassinated. With each event, the war escalated a little more. At the time, Cornflower was working at a research hospital when it was absorbed into the Ministry of Peace. She soon found herself working on several experiments much more complex than anything she'd done before. To her horror, she had played a small part in the invention of the Mega Spells. That fact shook her to the core when she found out about it, but by that time, she had already left. Even though she was from Canterlot, it no longer felt like home. Red's father had been drafted into the army and ended up dying on the battlefield. This was while she was still pregnant. After that, she knew she needed a change, so she quit her position and moved far away from the Ministry of Peace headquarters in Canterlot. Her time with the Ministry of Peace led to someone taking notice of her from a company called Ivory Laboratories. The place they wanted to locate her to was a hospital in the little village of Lusitown. It was just the kind of safe and secluded home she was looking for. They had a greater chance of avoiding the bombs if worse came to worse. Plus, the job opportunity she was offered was too good to pass up, whereas the Ministry of Peace seemed to be the weak link in an already failing government. Ivory Laboratories had projects of their own, and they seemed to care about their projects not ending up with the zebras. At the end of it all, she just cared about her son. Right now, Lusitown was the answer. She came out of her thoughts and kissed him goodnight. She had to have the hope that he did, that Luna would protect them and they'd wake up the next morning. 
Night washed over the world as Equestria fell into darkness. The medicine would keep Red asleep, and Cornflower knew she needed the shut-eye also, so she took a few sleeping pills and went to bed. Red opened his eyes as the sun peeked through the window blinds. He took one breath and immediately started coughing. Cornflower heard this and found poor Red even worse off than he was the night before. She fed him some more of the medicine and told him he was not going to school. She didn't understand. The formula should be working for something as simple as a cold. Red was excited for the day off, even while shivering under the covers. Cornflower wanted to stay with him, but she knew she had to go to work. The hospital needed her specifically. They had something much bigger in the works, and they could not wait any longer to run their test. She put the telephone by Red Run's bedside and told him to call her if he felt any worse or needed her for anything. He agreed and watched as she left their house through the front door. You could see all of Lusitown from their hill. Down at the center, a large airship had landed on top of his mom's hospital. It was a military balloon, but had a large red plus sign on the side. As his mom disappeared down the street, the war balloon took off as well, disappearing behind the nearby mountains. Now that she was out of sight, Red magically pulled Daring Dew and the Violet Star off of the shelf and turned to the right page. Daring Dew flew up to the Violet Star, the bright purple jewel that contained untold powers of darkness. But the Shadow Mancer was quicker and snatched the gem out of the shrine before she could get to it. The Violet Star began glowing brightly before a powerful beam of purple energy shot out of it, right through Daring Dew's hat. The hole began smoking, along with a few of the hairs in her mane. She flew around the temple, hiding behind whatever she could. The violet-purple laser burned its way through some of the walls. There was no escape, and Daring Dew was trapped with the black-cloaked figure. The energy stopped, so she gazed around the corner. He was gone, slipped away into one of the shadows. Daring looked at the door, wondering how she could move aside the large stone. But that's when she had an idea. She darted over to the slab and waited. On a nearby wall, the darkness on the floor seemed to come alive, and the Shadow Mancer leaped out of it. Using the Violet Star, he fired a powerful beam of light right at her. But Daring Dew jumped aside at the last moment, and the energy burned its way through the door to the temple. Once it was open, she made her escape. When she looked back, the Shadow Mancer was right behind her, slipping through the same crack in the stone. She galloped down the hallway, then turned around, seeing. Something distracted Red before he could turn the page. The normally quiet mountain town was suddenly full of noise, a noise even greater than the engines of the airships. It was a siren, an air raid siren. The kind he had learned in school meant something really bad was about to happen. He picked up the phone and tried to call his mom, but there was no dial tone. Instead, a robotic-sounding voice told him to go to his nearest stable. That was a problem, though. They didn't have a stable in Lusitown. His mom told him that if something bad happened, they would go to the hospital, that they'd be safe there. So he quickly packed up his backpack, shoving it full of things he couldn't leave behind, like the Daring Do book. He could feel his heart racing as the siren got louder. He galloped a few feet, then sneezed again, then made it to the front door. When he opened the door, he saw thin white clouds sailing over the sky. They were all coming from the same place in the distance, but were then branching off, approaching different targets. Before he could step through the door, he saw a bright blue flash over the hospital. A blast of hot air washed over his small body, sending him tumbling backwards into the house. He tried to stand up again, but he couldn't. The air was holding him down, pouring over him like a waterfall. Before he could even try something else, he fell asleep again. Red wasn't sure how long he was asleep, but when he woke up, all he could see was blue. It was the same bright blue light that had put him to sleep in the first place. He rolled over onto his stomach and stood up. Again, he looked around, but again, everything was the same blue glow, an infinite expanse with no detail or texture. It was only when he took a first step did he look down and notice his hooves. He couldn't see his hooves. He held them right up to his face, waved them back and forth, but there was nothing. 
He closed his eyes, and the blue glow was replaced by an inky blackness. But every time he opened his eyes, only the blue glow greeted him. He was blind, he thought to himself. It was just like Daring Do in the leopard's eye when the villain made her blind and trapped her in a labyrinth. Carefully, Red Run stepped forward. He thought he should be walking on the carpet of his living room, but everything felt much softer than that, like it was covered in cotton balls. After walking a few feet, he felt a soft thunk when his horn tapped against something. Within moments, he heard a muffled creaking, then a thump as the thing fell against something very hard. Red reached out with his magic, feeling it, and picked it up. It was heavy, and larger than he was. It was the front door to their house, having fallen off the frame and landing on the front steps. He could not see the familiar yellow glow of his magic though, it was still only the blue light filling his senses. He was able to see things a little bit with his horn, but not much. It was like holding a candle in the darkness. You could only gain light for a few feet in all directions, and even then, it's mostly shadows. He set the door aside and circled around looking for his backpack. Something was very wrong with his house. Nothing was where it should be, and whole sections of the walls weren't there anymore. His backpack was nowhere to be found. Frustrated, he gave up and decided to just go. He walked down the steps before missing the last step and landing on his face on the brick path. Tears welled up in his eyes as he felt the sting in his nose. He was overwhelmed by all of this. He tried calling out to his mom, but the words were rough in his throat. He could barely speak, his voice hoarse and dry. At least he could breathe normally again and wasn't sneezing anymore. His mom's medicine helped to that. Although it left a weird aftertaste in his mouth, every time he breathed, it tasted like raisins. It didn't matter, his mom would have a way to fix his eyes, and voice, and everything else too. His mom had a medicine for everything. He had to get to the hospital no matter what. As soon as he found his mom, everything would be okay. Red Run felt his way along the brick path. It was hard to tell the difference between anything. It all felt soft, like he had laid on his leg for too long and it fell asleep. He guided his way with the sharp edge of the brick path versus the grass that didn't feel like it was there anymore. Soon, he got past what used to be the picket fence in front of their yard and found the edge of the street. Lusitown was not a big place. He normally walked to school every day meeting up with friends at each block. There was one main road that came up from one side of the mountain and ran through the town and back down the other side of the mountain. The Ivory Laboratories Hospital sat right in the middle of town along the main road. The town used to be just a few cottages, a quick stop along the mountain pass, but when the hospital was built in recent years, the airship dock and the size of the facility caused Lusitown to grow from a few dozen to a few thousand residents. The hospital was now the whole reason for the town's existence. Every road led to it, and Red Run knew every road. With each step, following the edge of the sidewalk, he felt more confident. There were a few points where he had to stop. Something would be blocking the edge of the sidewalk, and he'd have to go around. First it was a telephone pole, which he was able to jump over. The next was more difficult. It was a cart of some kind. When he circled around to the outside of it, feeling the edges, he stopped when he reached the end of the harness. Something was still attached to it. It wasn't alive, not anymore. Just putting his hoof against it caused it to rattle and a few pieces to fall away. He wasn't sure which part of the skeleton he'd touched, but he quickly galloped around it, hoping to forget about it altogether. Red was starting to make out a distinction the further he walked. The blue glow seemed to all be coming from a specific point. It was like seeing the sun behind a layer of clouds, that place where the clouds are at their brightest. Red was sure that that was the hospital. The first time he saw the blue light, it was centered on the big metal pole that the airships would connect to. His mom told him that besides being a dock, the pole was also a radio mast that retransmitted all the music and phone calls between both sides of the mountain. As he walked, he realized that he couldn't feel any wind. There was usually a steady breeze passing through the town because of its place in the mountains. But now, the air was still. 
It had a thick, dusty feel to it, even while everything felt numb. When Red brushed back his mane, he could feel a puff of something trail off of him. It was just like Daring Dew on the Sands of Ages, when she had to wear a thick scarf around her head and goggles just to keep the desert sandstorms off of her. He wished there was a wind like that. It would have left everything feeling a little more normal, even as he stumbled blindly through the ashy blue haze. After a few blocks of this stillness, something finally broke the relative calm. A black shape ambled out from a vertical separation in Red's vision, likely the edge of a wall or house. It was like a silhouette against the blue glow that still dominated the world he had awoken to. The source of the blue light still hung in the air above the hospital, but this shadowy figure stood between them. Red couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was the first thing he was seeing, but something about it seemed so familiar. The inky black pony trotted closer to him, apparently taking notice. That's when his mind began reeling. It was the Shadowmancer. He screamed at the figure, which began to circle him. A glowing purple orb appeared next to the shadow's head. It was the Violet Star. It must be. And with a flash, a beam of bright purple light erupted from the point, sailing over Red as he ran sideways in the other direction. The Shadowmancer started chasing him. He galloped as fast as he could toward the center of the blue light, but he felt himself stumble and trip over something. Another bright beam of energy burned the ground next to him. It created a flat purple mark, making the road somewhat visible again against the ethereal blue he was trapped in. Red Run stumbled his way and continued moving as fast as he could. He was faster than the Shadowmancer, which could not maintain a perfect pony shape. He was distorted, like he couldn't form properly. But soon, Red Run found out why. Two more shadows stepped into view from behind invisible walls. They had hidden in the shadows that he couldn't see, like the one chasing him. They were all distorted and black. They were like beings of pure evil, sucking in all the light around them. Just like the first one, each of them had glowing purple lights next to their heads. He was able to duplicate the gem, too. Both beams fired, crossing right over Red as he stumbled over something in the road. Before they could react, he scampered between them. The first Shadow Mancer sent out a beam of energy, but instead of missing, this one found a target. The bright purple beam sliced through the neck of one of the other shadows. The shadow gave a loud, unearthly hiss as the laser ripped through him. It collapsed on the ground, and the rest of its inky black form began dissolving away, until it had become part of the ethereal landscape. Seeing this was able to free Red from some of the terror he felt. The Shadowmancer could be killed. He felt around with his magic and grabbed hold of something he had tripped on. It was another skeleton. He picked up the skull and flung it at the nearest shadow, before running off again toward the blue light. Red turned a corner, and the shadows disappeared behind an invisible wall. The blue light was high in the sky now. Red was close. Finally, he felt a wall, a very long wall for a very large building. This was it. This was the hospital. He moved along the side, feeling for a door. He didn't know which side he was touching. His escape from the Shadowmancer had confused him. Eventually, he found a corner and turned and what he saw sank his heart inside. Dozens of shadows were standing huddled around the center of some point along the wall. He took a few steps backward, but heard a dull thumping and turned. Three other shadows were coming up behind him. A purple blast of energy sailed through the air, striking Red in one of his legs. He screamed and fell backwards on the ground. The purple burn had now made part of his leg visible as it throbbed painfully. All of the shadows had gathered around him now. Tears were welling up in his eyes as they moved in closer. He began crying, but couldn't feel the moisture on his cheeks. He couldn't feel anything. The air was still without wind. Everything he touched felt soft and numb. Even with his magic, he could barely find his way through the town where he had spent his whole life. One of the shadows stepped forward, the Shadowmancer himself, with the violet star glowing, preparing to end him. Red gave one last desperate plea. He shouted to the sky through his tears, calling out for his mom.
It wasn't fair. He had come so close. He just wanted his mom. Just wanted all of this to be over. The Shadowmancer paused at this, gazing down at him as he was huddled on the ground. The purple glow of the gem disappeared into the blue haze. The Shadowmancer stepped closer to Red, leaning in toward him as if he was curious. Then the shadow spoke. It was a distant, grainy sound, like the voice was coming from deep inside the black void. Red just looked at it again, not sure what to do. It spoke again, like it was expecting an answer. However, he couldn't make out any of the words. It all sounded the same to Red, like sand rubbing against the bottom of your shoes. I don't understand you, he said in a dry, raspy voice. Two other shadows moved in closer as well. All three were standing around him, talking in the strange, sandy voices. Once they reached some kind of decision, the Shadowmancer offered out his hoof. Red wasn't sure what to do. He could try to run away, but with his legs still burning, he wouldn't move very fast or get very far. If he tried to fight them, he'd be killed for sure. His only choice was to trust them. So he reached up with his good leg and the shadow helped him stand. The Shadowmancer guided him as they walked toward the circle where most of them were still waiting. The hospital door pulled open and Red could actually see the edges of the hallway. The blue light was more dim inside and the corners were even darker. He walked in with only the Shadowmancer himself walking through the door as it slid closed. All the others stayed behind. It was just like Daring Do and the Violet Star, only the Shadowmancer wasn't trying to kill him anymore. He wasn't chasing Red through the hallway like he chased her. Red wondered what the difference was, before realizing that he never got to finish the book. He didn't know what was at the end of the corridor. Why had the ending become so different now that he had reached the conclusion? What was the difference? At the end of the hallway, another door opened. Behind it was another shadow, this one much more defined. A completely distinct silhouette, one that seemed so familiar. It galloped through the door, coming right up to him. As soon as it did, it picked him up, wrapping its arms around him. Red hugged her back, knowing exactly who she was. Standing next to the door was a third shadow, this one larger than all of them, and it was seeing her form with the large flowing mane that Red knew who had guided him there, who had protected him from the other shadows, who had brought him and his mother back together. It was Luna. Now I lie myself to sleep, in my dreams that Luna keeps, and that with all the princess might, she will keep away the frights. The tale you're about to hear are the final thoughts of my life, a muddled mix of what went through my mind as I approached a death I had chosen for myself. Through the herd, the dun I stalked, pushing past ponies, ignoring their talk, my head bowed by sackcloth covered to conceal my stripes, my sin, my other. Oh, sorry came the cheerful words as I bumped into one of their pastel herd. He turned to face me, smile on his lips, and then he turned away quickly, his smile having slipped, for by unfortunate chance my stripes had he glanced. I gathered myself, ignoring his insult, it was not the worst blow these ponies had dealt. I pushed through the chaos, the herd, the crowd, in search of a place where my kind were allowed. And then came the shout, exuberant joy, from a child nearby me, raising a toy steel ranger to announce to his father, the pony who'd snubbed me, that his heroes were coming, but that he was too short to see over the packed din of the crowd who were talking so loud, talking so loud. The father raised his child to his shoulders. The crowd whooped and cheered at the procession, the march of the steel ranger soldiers. 
I had heard of this tradition when being briefed for my mission. Ponies took any reason to celebrate. Even sending their children through Hell's Gates. With each act and each deed, these ponies grew crueler. As a result of the nightmare, their ruler. Many regret not excising them sooner. The day we discovered their new ruler was Luna. I shook my head, dislodging the thoughts of the poet, overcomplicated in his thoughts, convoluted and terrified of the future before him. I was not supposed to be here, staring down into the parade and fearing for what tomorrow would bring. Instead, I fragmented that part of my mind and shuffled it off, concealing it behind my other thoughts. I chose instead to focus on the parade of fools on their way to die. Oh yes. This wasn't quite like the parade days of old, where balloons and floats drifted down the street to distract ponies from their silly troubles. Now the floats were replaced with a battalion of steel-clad devils, cruel hooves drumming down the Manhattan streets and belting out patriotic anthems, the surrounding crowds cheering them onward, celebrating their impending murder of my countrymen. How distant will these anthems sound when the Iron Bastards are surrounded by the chorus of Scarlet War? <laughs> not that they... Ah, not that they'll ever reach the battlefield. That was... That was all in the morning. I later found myself far beyond the voices of ponies, tucked away in a hastily crafted bunker beneath the ground. Within that bunker, there was a room used to store the flotsam from above ground. In that room lay several other zebras whom I had never met before. When I'd entered the room, they offered me a variety of grunts before rolling over in their brown blankets, returning to sleep. We shared no words. There were no words to share. A small radio lay abandoned in the center of the room. No voice echoed out of it, which is good. It was... When the voices started to come out, that's when, that's when we all would have reason to be scared. But for now, it was silent. I sighed. I, I cleared my mind and made my way to an unremarkable box in the corner of the room. I climbed on top of it, laying my back against the cement-colored wall. <laughs> I smiled at the thought of the wall. They hadn't even bothered to paint it. I guess they knew deep down they'd never need to. Quiet black filled my mind. Allow for a moment my thoughts to wander as I cast back my mind down the winding track to my home in yonder zebraca, the fatherland. It sure was blessed by our Caesar of sky and sand. Picture my form of diminutive stature, a wide-eyed seed gazing to the mind's lure, the act of shaking our system's pillars to their core. Tis the lust of young men to unleash impossible truths coated upon our idealistic tongues. Such a youth was I, dedicated to the cultivation of my mind. I saw minds unparalleled in the years above me, minds to change the world and guide the generations of 100 years from now. It was these minds that became my inspiration, the catalyst for my development. I walked along their hoofsteps and tried to fill their shoes, I walked in their shadow and became eclipsed in their great ways. When the war came, they were the minds that guided our generation and brought a country to arms, convinced us to fight and die for our honor. Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori, went the saying in the old language of my people. We sang for the fatherland, we wept for the fatherland, and when the time came and equestrian soldiers fired their weapons into us, we died for the fatherland. It was then that these minds no longer needed for their words, were thrown to the front lines. It was there that I witnessed their fall firsthand. They fell with no ceremony, with no honors, with no remembrance but my own. Yet they did not flee, for their devotion guided their actions. We shall sing for the fatherland, we shall weep for the fatherland. But the fatherland shall not weep for us. They weep only for what we represent. They weep only for the whole. The individual vanished a very long time ago. I recall... 
I recall a passage once written by the first to die. He said, These are the times that try our souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. (laughs) These words no longer hold true in my eyes. Then there was a sound, this strange, I don't know, but it woke me up. I, I opened my eyes and found that for some reason the quiet black had not really abandoned me. My thoughts were adjusting slowly, but eventually I, I remembered it was night. You know, and this should come as no surprise. I turned over, trying to find a more comfortable place to sleep. But it was weird, I couldn't. And I scanned my immediate surroundings and... <laughs> And then it hit me. There was no place left for me to sleep on. My legs fell away, swept out from under me, and my head tumbled forwards, sending me spinning into the emptiness. I screamed, but no sound came out. Just me trapped in blackness and silence. Damning, maddening silence. Try it. Try it for a moment. Try... Trap yourself in my torment. Trap yourself in my silence. This only lasted briefly, though. I quickly slammed back down onto the ground and knocked out my two front teeth. It hurt so much. I howled out in pain, still still wrapped in silence because there... Nothing... Nothing came out. My voice had abandoned me, taken leave and fled in terror. And there was this tingling in the back of my... I don't know how to explain it. And there... I, I, I put it to the back of my mind and I tried to just... Rub the, rub the blood from the first staining my muzzle. I didn't, <laughs> you know. Blood and soft fur. It's, it's a really poor combination. Pony, zebra, whatever it is. We weren't meant to bleed. I looked at the ground and searched for my teeth. I don't, I'm not sure why. I just didn't want to leave a part of myself behind and I but I found no I didn't find my teeth I just found the street I was outside in the city center where where the parade had been happening earlier that day and the steel rangers were no longer there and the crowd wasn't wait the crowd they they they, they are there they, I can see them they're, they're, they're standing on the side of the road. They're... Wait. No. no it's, I recognize them. Each and every one of them. I know the details of every single pony. Every individual pony there. And... It's, it's not possible. I barely looked at just a few of them. There's no way I should know what any of them look like. Never mind all of them. This is... It's not... I know their name. No. Why do I know their names? Why are they all looking at me? Stop looking at me! No, st- Stop it! I don't understand. Why do I know their names? I, do- I shouldn't- I shouldn't know their names. I don't know these ponies. Stop looking at me! Stop it! No, I don't- I- I don't know you! Stop. Please. Please stop looking at me. Please stop looking. No. I don't know who you are. I don't know. Please stop it. They're cheering me on. I can can see them. They're they're just dancing. They're celebrating. Why? You have no reason to celebrate. No, stop cheering for me. 
I can, I can see that they want this. They want it. They want me to do this. They're happy I'm here. I take a step forward to return. I need to get to my room underground. I need to get away from them. I. Why do I know their names? The ponies. This. They're not moving. Why aren't. The ponies aren't moving. They're all very, very still. The ponies are all standing at. staring at me with wide, unblinking eyes. They're never shifting their focus. I can. That pony over there. I know you. I, you bumped into me earlier. He's he's holding up his hoof. He's he's got my teeth. He's smiling at me. It's this toothless, lipless smile. Like like, like there's just black tear replaced his maw. This his muzzle is just it's torn. Like you like like if you dragged a knife through flesh, and inside you just had void. You had nothing. His body's just, it's remaining static and, oh god, his eyes are, oh god, his eyes are rolling backward into his skull, falling away and leaving yet more black tears in his face. His legs are shuddering and he's collapsing. His body has been brought down on his neck, but not his face. No, that, it's, that's held in place, but the skin, all the skin attached to his face is just torn away. A headless sheet of pony fur has just tussled on the sidewalk, no bones or meat within, and my broken teeth just lying on top of them. I'm focusing my horrified gaze on his face. It's still hanging there in the air with no eyes or teeth and black pits where his... <laughs> There's a beat. A break in time before the rest of the crowd open their mouths, their pits, eyes all being yanked back by the same invisible string in their sockets. I, that pony's pony to my left. His mouth is just the, the tear is expanding. The, the skin and fur is jerking back and forth, like being carved with a with a blunt knife. I can hear it. I can hear the knife carving through his meat. I can see. If I focus, I can make out the sound of a butcher grunting with exertion and cursing as he carves through his... He's using my voice. And then the ponies. They begin to scream. And this time I hear them. The anthem penetrating the soundless lair. I hear them dying and screaming. Their fury and rage and horrors and fears and losses. Lives all summed up in a single petrified sound. And as they scream, the details begin to fade and slip from their faces. They're indistinguishable from each other. I can't remember their names. Oh, thank God. But no... It's somehow worse than before. And they're all screaming with my voice like with the butcher. I shut my eyes and hold my hooves to my ears. I beg for this nightmare to end. The ground, the ground's falling away around me. It's closing in. I'm running out of space to stand. It's hurling me down, dashing me on the jagged rocks, breaking my body and tearing away my flesh, burning me with fire from the inside, riddling me with bullets and penetrating me with knives and murdering me again and again and... I scream and I thrash as a new pain arises, as a hundred something shifts between my skin, shoving bones out the way and growing from my outer layer. I look down to see what they are. Teeth! There are teeth growing through my legs and chest. I try to scream, but I can feel them growing through my tongue. Fifty rotting, disgusting molars growing within my mouth. The blackness returns. They grow through my eyes. The orbs just pop and burst, sending juices running down my face and over the teeth as they continue to sprout and grow until finally...
the world came to a stop. There was a sound, and then silence. I saw myself in the mirror, my eyes emerald green. This was truly. It was just a dream. We come from quiet black, from the universe minus itself, minus the stars and the earth. We come from the quiet black, from the screams and the laughter taken away. My unconscious mind had drifted off to my hearth. Emerald eyes saw my wife and my child as they saw the news and started to laugh. They would not know that my name was destined to be filled on granite that stands as an alicorn's teeth, straight in perfect rows with a thousand others. I wished they would know. I wanted to tell them so they would know that I was here to sow the peace of our nations, to rise above my station. Please, please to God, lend me the strength to send these pony bastards to their decrepit end. Shall I speak more clearly? Shall I bereft myself of the poet's cloak, the complex convolutions of my wicked pen strokes? Let my pretense to the wind be blown, let my caution to the wind be thrown. Let me tell you why you deserve this. This fate is one of your construction. You horde of rabble have let your minds unravel, and just in case my point you misconstrue, Fucking morons, your wits have deserted you. Assaulting our borders, you started this war. Before that, for resource, you made us our whores. You slaughtered our families, our guilty, our innocent. The killing of fathers leaves sons raised hellbent. Your doom for our young is a lifelong objective, and your painful demise is my personal directive. Once, I found myself asleep in a shelter with bodies lying to my left and right, all refugees, but not all of them were breathing. There was no space for the living and the dead to sleep separately, so in the end we simply shared. First, we placed a layer of corpses onto the hardened concrete floor, leaving no space between them, concealing any trace that the ground had ever been there. Then came my friends, the living and I, slowly, with tears that coated our eyes. We climbed, we climbed, across corpses of loved ones and enemies and family. We climbed over the dead, and newsflash, they make really shitty beds. And here we are. Can you blame me for my hate? If it makes you feel better, I bear it not just toward equestrian monsters, but to my own people. We have changed, we've warped, we've twisted, and allow me to share one last moment of idealistic youth. Allow me to think myself higher than you, to think myself better in just a way, in a way of intellect and mind, so that I might say that I have passed notice on everyone and I find you guilty. I find you deserving of the punishment I am about to dole out. The horror of the story is what we're capable of. The horror is what our blind devotion has wrought. The horror is the realization that the minds I worshipped and... The minds I worshipped and molded myself after belong to nothing but fools who deserved only my laughter. <laughs> Sweat. I hope it's not in my own control. 
reacting to the adrenaline of the dream. For a moment, I wasn't certain if I'd woken up yet. My heartbeat was so fast. It didn't... It really, it didn't really seem possible that this was real. But, but I suppose I just didn't want it to be. Yeah, no, I, don't, I don't want it to be real. I... <laughs> when my mind finished clearing, I could... I could, I could, my ears were twitching. There was something playing in the background, something that should have been so obvious to me. It was the thing that woke me up in the first place. The small radio that lay abandoned in the center of the room. But it was silent no more. Someone was screaming through it, begging for a response as my companions were slowly waking up. I climbed off the unremarkable box that I had made for my bed and approached the radio, rubbing the exhaustion and nightmare from my ears just in time to hear a voice. My first stood on end. My eyes closed and I saw every face from my dream. Their faces losing their identities. Their names finally gone from my mind and their teeth no longer growing from my body. It seems I'm... <laughs> uh, it seems I must conceal a laugh and yes, at your expense. For this I shall incur your wrath because at your expense I've wound a tale of metaphor in the hope my point you see of the costs of pony zebra war. Indeed you've fallen prey to the intellectual's way, a trap too lengthy, too smart by half, the mind that loves itself too much. It seems that I have been caught out, the lying storyteller, quite the lout. You may say I have a liar's tongue, you may wish my tale be gone and done. There was no horror for nightmarish fear lovers, except the horrors we inflict upon each other. I opened my eyes. The last of the fever dream had ended. The pitch guilt had reached its boiling point. I knew what I had to do. Despite the dread that filled my heart and soul, I would be damned to hell for the souls I was about to take, but we had no choice. The Ministry of Morale had figured out our plans. A zebra infiltration of a Manhattan building, a company who bore the name Four Stars. But they did not know the extent to our designs. Oh, no, they did not. They did not know the damage that had been brought upon Zebration minds. Quiet black. I turned around to my resting place. I wondered often, when I was younger, what a killer thought before he ended the life of an innocent face to face. I wondered often what a general thought before he ordered an army into battle, bringing on the deaths of thousands. Did they torture themselves? Did their minds warp? Did they understand the horror of their actions? I wonder now if the ponies of the future will think of me and my companions. I wonder if they will think about what my mind contemplated before I pressed the button. After all, when it comes to mass killings, I'm about to hold the record. We came from quiet black. I opened the unremarkable box which had served as my bed. To quiet black, we shall return. I stared at the device within the box. A simple thing. And a simple movement was all it took. And to quiet black, the world returned. <laughs>